Um, our next session is on the impact of the latest recommendations of FAT of, um, recommendations on your anti-money line program. Um, we're very honored to have um, Dr. Rohan Betty, Managing Director of Asian Compliance, um, to speak on this session. He was formerly the Regional Head of Anti-Money Laundering Compliance and Economic Sanctions for Asia at Bank of America Merrill Lynch for four years. Um, he's always been uh, the Regional Privacy Executive. He has over 20 years of experience, and for the first 10 years of his career, he was on the business side before moving into compliance in Singapore. This exposure is responsible for his practical and business-friendly approach. Please extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Betty, or Rohan. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, ACAMS, for inviting me to Taiwan. Before I start on this topic, and uh, I'd just like to uh, extend a word of caution, this is going to be a technical session. It is, uh, I've, I've gone recommendation by recommendation, and uh, there is a lot of detail there, so it will need an element of concentration from your side. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, I come up with a program checklist, and that will sort of give you an overview of what I've said. In any case, uh, almost everything that is there in the, the uh, what I'm going to speak is there in your handout. So those of you who don't pick up a point or two can always refer to the handout, and you'll have the detail there. So the handout is actually a detailed version of my presentation. So in terms of the uh, agenda for today, I I'm going to be talking uh, about preparing for the program impact. Then I'll talk about enhancements in standards. I'll talk about enhancements to laws and regulations that you can expect. I'll give you a program checklist. And then I'll take you through some typologies for training. So first and foremost, uh, this is going to impact your business model. For example, tax evasion. So tax evasion is now a predicate offense for money laundering. Uh, so you need to have policies, procedures, and systems uh, around this issue. It will also impact on operations in countries with countermeasures. So uh, you know the cost of doing business in such countries will increase. It impacts your policies and procedures, your systems, and resourcing. For example, it requires global programs. It requires a risk-based approach, so there's greater focus on risk-based approach. Uh, beneficial ownership and identification and verification processes have been evolved in the new FATF 40. And it requires information sharing for risk management purposes. So all these things are going to uh, you know, cost more for, for, for banks and financial institutions. It expands international cooperation and the financial intelligence units, PAS, to ask for information. As a result of this, it increases regulatory risk, for example, around tax evasion specifically. So you know, in the, in the past, um, regulators uh, were not cooperating as much as they would in the future, as a result of which you'll also have inquiries around tax evasion, and information will change cross borders. Uh, so the inquiries would come through the money laundering channel. In the past, tax evasion was out of the AML gambit. So tick box compliance is not acceptable. The risk-based approach needs focus on. And accordingly, training will be a key issue. Developing a risk-based approach, bringing in that culture from top to down, is not an easy thing. And training has to be an integral part of the entire thing. Expect supervisory focus, which is you know the regulatory focus, on risk-based approach validation during inspections, and particularly on your risk assessments. So, Huge amount of new focus on risk assessments. Uh, and, and that's the basis for your AML program. Ongoing quality assurance will become key to ensuring group-wide consistency. So QA processes, quality assurance processes. This is, this is not necessarily your compliance review that I'm talking about, not necessarily your corporate audit. In, 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 in the larger banks, they have separate QA teams within business and within operations that actually look at uh, ongoing transactions. Okay, Dealing with privacy concerns is key to sharing of information for risk management purposes. Review of clients is needed to assess clients' tax risk profile and the legitimacy of assets booked. 
So in Singapore and Hong Kong, they've already come out with papers, and they're expecting people to do full reviews of their existing accounts. Effective governance structures are key to ensuring an effective risk-based approach. And this will involve general compliance, legal, risk, and business in AML matters. Let's talk about the enhancements in standards that you can expect. So the review of the FATF 40 plus 9, so you had FATF 40 principles on money laundering and nine principles on terrorist financing. The review was done between October 2010 to February 2012. And then they came out with the new principles uh, on, on uh, money laundering and terrorist financing. So there were two consultation papers, and they integrated the terrorist financing nine standards into the FATF 40. So there was no longer a FATF 40 plus nine, just FATF 40 now. So that's the new numbering scheme. So the new numbering scheme is divided into seven sections. And this is the first section is AML, CFT, policy, and coordination, which is recommendations one to two. And this touches upon the risk-based approach. The risk-based approach is actually touched upon a number of points, but dominantly in the first recommendation. And then you have money laundering and confiscation, which is in recommendations three to four. Terrorist financing and financing of proliferation, which is in recommendations five to eight. Preventive measures, such as custom and due diligence, in recommendations nine to 23. Transparency and beneficial ownership of legal persons and arrangements in recommendations 24 and 25. Powers and responsibilities of competent authorities and other institutional measures in recommendations 26 to 35 and international cooperation in recommendations 36 to 40. So let's first focus on serious tax crimes. So serious tax crimes, which are both indirect and direct taxes, are now a predicate offense for money laundering. And this, what the FATF has done is that they've clarified smuggling. So they always had smuggling on their list of predicate offenses. And what they've done is that in brackets, they've added including in relation to customs and excise duties and taxes. And they've separately added a point saying tax crimes related to direct taxes and indirect taxes. So they're requiring you to file suspicious transaction reports. They're requiring a sharing of information cross-border, which creates regulatory risk. And Singapore and Hong Kong have issued a paper on this issue. So as you can see, this is an old photograph from 1983, tax cheating, bad and getting worse. Still the same issue. So you need to supplement, so how do you identify and assess tax-related risks? You need to supplement your existing due diligence procedures with additional client acceptance and surveillance checks to understand and assess a client's tax risk profile. This includes obtaining additional information and where necessary, verifying the information or representations made by the client, identifying and incorporating specific tax-specific risk flag indicators and other parameters to conduct a risk assessment to identify high-risk clients. So in the Singapore paper, consultation paper, they're actually now talking of tax-specific red flag indicators. In the past, the thinking on tax evasion was that it's ind indistinguishable from money laundering, and no one was trying to find out specific tax-related indicators. But now they're saying, it's a slight change in thinking over the years, they're saying that, yes, you should have tax-specific red flag indicators, and you should conduct a risk assessment to identify your high-risk clients. And after you do that, you should do a critical review of all existing accounts to assess the tax legitimacy of assets book and identify high-risk accounts. And then you need to conduct enhanced due diligence for clients assessed to represent, to present high risk of willful or fraudulent tax evasion. So there's a huge task ahead for Singapore bankers and in Hong Kong where they basically have to review their entire database. So how do you manage and mitigate tax-related risks? What the Singapore consultation paper is expecting you to do is to apply control measures, including escalation and approval policies, for example, to senior management approval, commensurate with the assessed tax risks. 
institute ongoing monitoring procedures for detection of transactions and adopt appropriate risk mitigation for high-risk accounts, file a suspicious transaction report if you suspect or have reasonable grounds to suspect that the assets are the proceeds of willful or fraudulent tax offenses, maintain proper records of due diligence performed to assess the tax legitimacy of assets accepted, including for account acceptance and retention, ensure that staff adhere to all internal control and policy and procedures and have provided adequate training. So it's the regular stuff that you do for identifying any risk, except that it's now specifically focused on tax evasion. And the Singapore Private Banking Industry Group was to provide a conceptual framework, so they were going to do some more work on this. I haven't heard in terms of whether they have or you know, where that paper is. Let's now move on to the actual FATF 40 recommendations. So risk-based approach is covered in recommendation one and in others. So the risk-based approach focuses on both the country and, and the firm level. So it formally integrates direction in earlier guidance for industry sectors. So you know the FATF, it's not something new. The FATF was always talking about the risk-based approach. So they just formally integrated into the recommendations. They require that countries should clearly identify, assess, and understand risks and take action and apply resources to mitigate those risks. They give examples of risk factors and lower risk situations. The risk-based approach to the supervision of compliance with AML and CFT obligations includes things like covering the allocation of resources and for supervising financial institutions. The FATF requires appropriate information on the risk assessments and the resulting approach to supervision to be communicated to the private sector. So it's actually asking financial supervisors, what is your approach communicated to the private sector? So that's an important expectation, hopefully, for, for you guys. It's, expectations are placed upon regulated financial institutions and designated non-financial businesses and professions to assess and mitigate AML and CFT risks. So designated non-financial bu businesses and professions include things like casinos, real estate agents, dealers in precious metals and dealers in precious stones, lawyers, notaries, trusts, and company service providers. Financial institutions need to do a risk assessment prior to launch of new products, business practices, or the use of new or developing technologies, for example, remote data capture in the US, remote deposit capture. Now, this is something that happened in a particular bank where they basically got exposed to the risk of not filing suspicious transaction reports because they launched the product and then after a couple of years realized that that product could have fraud risks. And uh, that's the point that, uh, that's where this is coming from, which is that you need to focus on product risks. So product risks show itself in different things, of course, correspondent banking. It also shows itself in trade finance. And depending on whether you, your controls on the uh, global market side are good or not, it could also show itself in the form of derivative laundering, for example. So the different ways in which product risk could express itself. But as part, as part of your risk assessments that you do within your bank, it's not just a focus on line of business, it's also a focus on product. So that's the new, uh, I wouldn't say it's new, but it's, it's an enhanced focus that's come out in the last couple of, um, last two years. The FATF will update the guidance documents to reflect the changes in risk-based approach. The FATF will also consider developing additional compliance risk indicators and best practices to help supervisors and the private sector in the risk-based approach. And ACAMS tells me that they're going to provide, the FATF will provide guidance to countries on how to do their risk assessments. So you need to, so what do, what do financial institutions, banks need to do? You need to identify your money laundering and terrorist financing risks for customers, countries, or geographical areas and products, services, transactions, or delivery channels. You need to identify high-risk situations, and those are covered. You'll find those defined in recommendations 12 to 16 and in interpretive note to recommendation 10. So that's where you're going to find them if you're trying to look for them. If you want, if you want them for your policies and procedures, look in those recommendations. Your policies and procedures, your controls, need to be approved by senior management to manage and mitigate risks. So a number of banks, they sometimes get the policy approved, 
but they don't get the procedure improved. Uh, now they're saying very clearly in the FATF recommendations, policies, procedures, and controls approved by senior management. So how often do you get it approved? Once? You're supposed to get it done. If you're doing an annual risk assessment and you're updating your policies and procedures and controls, then you should be getting your policies, procedures, and controls approved annually from your senior management as part of your entire governance process. You need to monitor the implementation of those controls and to enhance them. Measures should be consistent with the national requirements and guidance. You may differentiate the extent of measures depending on type and level of risk. For example, you may do normal customer due diligence for customer acceptance measures, but enhance customer due diligence for ongoing monitoring or vice versa. You cannot, and this is specific in the FATF recommendations, okay? So it's an important point, the next one. You cannot assume that a customer having a lower risk for ID and verification purposes automatically is so for transactions monitoring. Very clearly there. I think in the interpretive note, not, not in recommendation 10, but in the interpretive note to in recommendation 10. It's very clearly there. It's lower risk for onboarding does not mean it's lower risk for transactions monitoring. And then of course, the risk-based approach will help you to focus resources and reduce the burden of compliance. <clears throat> Let me talk now of, about the sanctions recommendations, which is recommendations five, six, and seven. So sanctions five, six, and seven, it now covers the UN sanctions, financial sanctions on proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Of course, this, this thing is always, uh, it can sometimes confuse you, what the hell are they talking about anyway? It's nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons and the means of delivery. Okay, so nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons and the means of delivery. The sanctions recommendations in the EFATF have been updated, incorporating obligations of the United Nations Security Council resolutions 1267 and, su and successor, and 1373, which is basically on terrorism and terrorist financing. <clears throat> For North Korea, which is 1718, and Iran, which is 1737, domestic authorities are required to communicate information about delistings and, and authorizations to access frozen funds and assets. This came out of a complaint in the consultation process, where the banks were complaining, one of the banking associations were complaining that we don't get information on delisting. So then the bankers, so the FATF have put this specifically, that the authorities are required to communicate information about delistings and authorizations to access frozen funds and assets. So you should expect that. If you're not getting it, expect it. The FATF proposes to subsequently enhance existing guidance to address implementation concerns for targeted financial sanctions. And what are those implementation concerns? Those implementation concerns are best covered in the Australian Bankers Association um, feedback during the consultation process. <clears throat> it says that financial institutions and DNFBs would benefit from regulatory body coordination on sanctions list content. For example, publication of meaningful data on a list entry. So basically saying, reduce our work, don't harass us, don't just give us a name, give us details. Give us the date of birth, give us a location, give us the reason for listing. And this will help us to achieve operational efficiencies. Consistency in spelling and identifying data items. And publication of a list of names of known, owned, or controlled entities to enhance intelligence on the lists. So give us the related entities. That's what the banks and financial institutions are imploring for. Moving on to the next recommendation, which is a nonprofit organization's recommendation eight. Further detail has been added for nonprofit organizations and vulnerabilities. I'm not going into that. <clears throat> Moving on to the customer due diligence and beneficial ownership requirements in recommendations 10, 24, and 25. The core CDD requirements have not changed. Authorities should have adequate, accurate, and timely access to beneficial ownership information. However, they clarify customer due diligence measures regarding the ID and verification of customers and beneficial owners for legal persons and legal arrangements using a risk-based approach. The identification information now includes the powers that regulate and bind the legal person or arrangement, for example, the memorandum and articles of association of a company. During the consultation process, this point was raised. Some bank said, but that's not an AML issue, that's a credit issue. But anyway, in the final form, 
is there. Okay, so when you're talking of identifying information, that's been increased. You now need to also get the powers that regulate and bind the legal person or arrangement. You also need to get the names of the relevant persons having a senior management position in the legal person or arrangement. For example, the senior managing director in a company or trustees of a trust. Why that's important is there in the next point because there's enhanced specificity for customer due diligence and beneficial ownership and control. So they now provide a step-by-step -step process which I'm gonna discuss a couple of slides later. And they're also now in the FATF recommendations accepting the idea of a numerical threshold. So they're saying a numerical threshold when determining controlling ownership of a legal person may be reasonable in some cases, for example, 25%. So the number 25% is actually mentioned there in the FATF recommendations. And that's not to say 25% is good, okay? 25% is good in a lower risk situation. HKMA, for example, requires 10% for private uh, unlisted companies. And then in, in Merrill, when we were, um, when we were doing uh, personal holding companies, we were identifying, which is you know your shell companies, for, which are created for holding investments. We were identifying every beneficial owner. So the zero, we were using a 0% threshold. There was no idea of 25% or 10%. It was zero, every beneficial owner for a shell company. <clears throat> so, okay. So enhanced transparency is required both in information collection and maintenance of information. Beneficial ownership information is needed to be maintained in the companies and in the company registries. So they're moving away from, the old focus was only on banks, they were flogging banks. You're the custodians of beneficial ownership. Now the tone, and they're not saying now you're not, they're still saying that, but their tone has changed a little bit, the focus has changed a little bit. They're saying companies should be collecting their information, company registries are also responsible for it. <clears throat> and for a trust, a trust registry is one option, and the focus is on now on the trustees to make sure that, so, so they're saying trust and company related service providers should be regulated, okay? For example, most trust and company service providers are basically lawyers, a lot of them are lawyers, and then lawyers have their own law regulatory, a self-regulatory organization. So you know, that's, that's the process. So initially they were going on the idea that trust registry is compulsory, but they diluted that idea a little bit. So they're saying it's one option. They give clear examples of enhanced customer due diligence and simplified customer due diligence measures. And what are those examples? I'm gonna talk in the next few slides. The beneficiaries of life insurance policies can be identified at payouts. They give flexibility. They give flexibility and clarity on the scope of reliance on customer due diligence by third parties. Okay? So they introduce an element of country risk into the evaluation whenever you have a third party when you're relying on. And they say intra-group reliance is possible if the risks are mitigated with group policies. So a clear example of where that didn't happen was HSBC, okay? Where they were dealing with their Mexico business, correspondent banking, traveler's checks, and uh, they regarded Mexico as, I think it was low risk, and uh, they basically, because it was an affiliate, their own bank, they didn't really look at it that carefully. Cost them, I believe, $1.9 billion, the largest fine ever. Financial institutions now apply enhanced due diligence based on overall risk posed by a country rather than just compliance with FATF standards, okay? So in the old FATF, you were either a member of the FATF or you were not a member. If you were a member, you were a good guy. If you were not a member, you were a bad guy. Now they take a slightly different view, which is a slightly more mature view, which is that we're gonna look at, you'll apply enhanced due diligence based on the overall risk posed by a country. Okay, so automatically if you were to look at Taiwan, if Taiwan's a non-member, it would be high risk, right? Because you're not a member. But this approach allows you to look at Taiwan with a bit more maturity. What's the actual overall risk? So they also identify a number of risk variables in recommendation 10. 
So they say when identifying money laundering and terrorist financing risks relating to type of customers, countries or geographical areas, and particular products, services, transactions, or delivery channel risk, please take into account risk variables impacting the level of customer due diligence measures. And examples of such variables include the purpose of an account or relationship, the level of assets to be deposited by a customer or the size of transactions undertaken, the regularity or duration of the business relationship. Okay, so very specific pieces of information which are to guide the level of customer due diligence. So obviously, you have to ask yourself the question, am I collecting this information? I'm sure the larger US, UK banks are. I'm not very sure whether the others would. Enhanced customer due diligence measures. So examples of enhanced customer due diligence measures for higher risk business relationships include obtaining additional information on the customer, for example, occupation, volume of assets, information available through public databases, internet, etc. So they actually, for the first time, mention internet, specifically mentioned. So everybody's now recognizing that Google, particularly Google search in local language, okay, is a very, which, and you do Google search in local language using the Google advanced function, by the way. So you put the name and you put a string of words like money laundering, terrorist financing, prostitution, uh, indictment, uh, you know, uh, jail. So name of the person and string of words and search on Google advanced, uh, using Google advanced tool, advanced search tool. And it should be in the local script. And when you do that search, you'll probably get more better information than most of the negative news uh, things that I've, I've seen. And uh, so not only, need, or not only do you need to uh, obtain additional information, you should also update more regularly the identifying data of customer and beneficial owner, okay? Generally, a KYC refresh process in a large bank is one, two, and three years. That's the standard. Even if you look at the UK guidance, et cetera, they always use the term one, two, and three, one, two, and three. The UK has a very interesting July 2011 report on high money laundering risk situations. Uh, if you ever get the time, do read that, because I think that's uh, kind of a cornerstone in this profession, that report. And it's a very good summary of good practices and bad practices. And uh, typically, one, two, three is the standard. So one, for if you have high risk PEPs, you do a KYC, a CDD refresh at least once a year. Of course, you can have a large transaction, and then you may do the refresh anyway during the year because you think that things have changed. But at least one, two, and three years. If you file suspicious transaction reports on customers, that makes them high risk. So you'll put them in the one-year cycle. Obtaining additional information on the intended nature of the business relationship. Obtaining information on the source of funds or source of wealth of the customer. So source of funds is where the money came from. So did it come from DVS Bank Singapore? And the source of wealth is a slightly more complex question. The origin of assets and how it grew to the existing level. And that question in a private bank is typically answered in at least a half page write up by the private banker. Obtaining information on the reasons for intended or performed transactions. Obtaining approval of senior management to commence or continue business relationship, conducting enhanced monitoring of the business relationship, such as a greater number and timing of controls applied, and selecting patterns of transactions that need further examination, requiring the first payment to be carried out through an account in the customer's name with a bank subject to similar customer due diligence standards. So simplified customer due diligence measures, and I'm sure that's of more interest to you than the enhanced one. <clears throat> the simplified one says, where the risks of money laundering or terrorist financing are lower, examples of measures are verifying the identity of customers and beneficial owners after the establishment of the business relationship. For example, if your account transactions are greater than a defined monetary threshold. Reducing the frequency of customer ID updates, okay? Reducing the degree of ongoing monitoring and scrutinizing of transactions using a reasonable monetary threshold. Inferring the purpose and nature from the type of transaction or business relationship applied. So this, of course, this would have to 
come into your, this is just the FATF guidelines, right? Your laws and regulations must reflect this. When the laws and regulations reflect this, that's the next stage. That's when you can actually start using some of the stuff. But it's, it's good stuff. <clears throat> Talking about beneficial ownership of legal persons or legal arrangements, uh, what are the steps? Okay, the steps for a legal person, uh, you know, a company for example, the steps to identify the natural person who is the ultimate beneficial owner. First, you try to identify the natural persons who ultimately have a controlling ownership interest. If doubt or if no one can be identified, then you aim to identify others that may exercise control over the customer through means other than a shareholding. And if these measures fail, then you take reasonable steps to identify the natural person holding a senior management position. And they also say that you're going to do this, these three steps, typically in a diversified ownership structure. Okay? So you have three steps, typically in a diversified ownership structure where you're doing, let's say, an investment banking transaction, and you have these complex ownership structures. I've seen ownership structures that look like trees, you know, five layers, seven layers, and right at the end, you've got another trust, and it's, it's uh, confounding sometimes. So then this, these three steps will help you in that thing. And then I think you have to also keep the bigger picture in mind that, you know, are you, is this a listed company somewhere along the line, which is partly owning it, things like that. That'll give you flavor. Is there anyone out there who is, you found, who's connected, is this a bad guy himself, or is connected to a bad guy, you know, things like that. So the overall picture has to be kept in mind when you're using this, you have to use it responsibly. <clears throat> For legal arrangements such as trusts, For legal arrangements such as trust, the identity of the settler, which is settler is the guy who puts assets into the trust, the trustees, the trustees are the legal owners of the trust, right? Legal owners of the assets, sorry. The protector, the protector is the guy who keeps a check on the trustee. Okay, so you make sure the trustee is doing things in line with the trust deed. And you don't always have to have a protector. And the beneficiaries, or class of beneficiaries, sometimes it's, could be my son and his current wife. Okay, so the wi current wife keeps changing, that's the class of beneficiary. And any other natural person exercising ultimate effective control. So trust structures can be very complex and all of these need to be identified. Simplified customer due diligence is possible in the case of listed companies where you have transparency of beneficial owners. That means that in the first place, you must be dealing with a good stock exchange, which is asking for beneficial ownership information from the listed company. So the risk out here is whether you trust the stock exchange or you don't trust the stock exchange. <coughs> transparency and beneficial ownership, a uh, little bit more detail on issues, as far as bearer shares and bearer share warrants are concerned, bearer warrants, bearer warrants are basically an entitlement to fully paid stock shares. There's explicit language and emphasis to prohibit them, okay? To convert them into registered shares or share warrants via DMAT. To immobilize them to, which is basically to hold them with a regulated financial institution or professional intermediary or require notification. So notification requires the shareholder with a controlling interest to notify the company and the company to record their identity. So very clear, the language is very clear on this whole bearer share issue in the FATF now recommendation. The next issue, which is an, you know another normal money laundering high risk situation, which is nominee shares and directors. For nominee shares and directors, they say they need to disclose the identity of their nominator, or they require that nominee shareholder and director to be licensed and the nominee status to be recorded in company registries. And this is a very, very important 
area. I, I in the past, have received emails from someone who was providing a nominee service, a private nominee service, sole proprietor pri a nominee service to uh, companies. And she says that, oh, now they're asking me to operate on the bank accounts, and should I do it? Is this, does this create risk for me? I said, well, you're an executive director, and with the executive director means you take the legal responsibility of the executive director. You're responsible for all frauds that happen on the account, on the company account. So she had no clue about her role and responsibility. So I sent her some extracts from, you know, I think it's Companies Act, I can't remember where I sent it. So the point is that I think this is a very, very good measure because I think this is, this whole business of nominee directors is something that money launderers and criminals exploit by getting somebody who's unemployed or somebody who's in need of money to act as their front man, uh, you know, so unwillingly, unsuspectingly, they get used. So hopefully, this business of licensing will help to result, will result in better quality. <clears throat> so PEPs, politically exposed persons in corruption, recommendation 12. Financial institutions should additionally identify domestic PEPs. So they already identify foreign PEPs. Okay? And in Singapore, we've already been doing that for some time because in spite of this FATF thing, uh, the FATF have already been putting pressure for, for identifying domestic PEPs. Persons who are or have been carrying out prominent functions for international organizations should be considered as PEPs. So someone working in the World Bank is a PEP. The risk-based approach, so you can, you can use a risk-based approach. It applies to domestic PEPs and PEPs of international organizations based on whether they have a higher risk, whether you consider that they have a higher risk business relationship. Foreign PEPs are treated as the highest risk category. You can't do any risk-based approach. So anybody who's abroad, a PEP opening an account with you, highest risk category. It's made more explicit that family members and close associates have the same measures as PEPs. So you find someone who's linked to a PEP, for all practical purposes, he is a PEP. Because he becomes a, comes under the category of family members and associates. FATF intends further guidance on implementing the PEP requirements, including on how to identify a PEP, his or her family members, and close associates. Okay? Moving on to the next uh, thing, which is your money value transfer systems. So there's increased emphasis on registration of money value transfer systems and enforcement which basically requires additional SDR filing focus for financial institutions. That's actually the FinCEN which, is, which mentions that, which is, the FinCEN is, uh, you know, I read the, the note on the FATF 40, basically interpreting the MVTS requirements and saying financial institutions therefore need to have additional focus on suspicious transaction report filing. Wherever you, have, wherever you suspect that some business, which is, you know, typically a mom and pop shop, is an unregistered money value transfer system. For wire transfers, which is recommendation 16, the FATF now requires additional information to enhance transparency. Financial institutions must include required and accurate originator information. And the new thing is, and required beneficiary information, which is name and account number if used on wire transfers. And financial institutions, including intermediary financial institutions, need to monitor for missing required originator and or beneficiary information. And you can have processes which are consistent with straight through processing. That's not a problem, but you need to monitor for it. It's been made explicit that intermediary financial institutions, you know, a, B, C, so what's, what B, what's B's role? They're the intermediary. Intermediary FIs also need to file SDRs and take freezing actions and comply with prohibitions of UN sanctions, UN resolutions for terrorism and terrorist financing, which is 1267 and 1373. The wire transfer rule is now linked with recommendation six, which is targeted financial sanctions on terrorism and terrorist financing, and this has been clarified. And they're now saying that below Euro 1,000 and US dollar 1,000, information is needed. In the past, they had this kind of exemption kind of thing, saying information is needed, even though it normally need not be verified. 
So group-wide programs and countermeasures, which is recommendation 18 and 19. So group-wide AML CFT programs. It's more explicit that financial groups should implement group-wide AML CFT programs, including policy and procedures for sharing information within the group. You must adopt higher of the two standards, which is the home country and the host country. And in the second consultation report, not in the final FATF 40, the FATF also mentions that supervisors should also work with their counterparts to facilitate intra-group cooperation and exchange of information by the private sector. So if Taiwan, for example, is not, Taiwan Bank is not having the cooperation or the information from a branch in Indonesia, then your supervisor should help you to get, talk to the supervisor in Th Indonesia and get the cooperation of your branch. In terms of countermeasures, okay, it's now based on a FATF call or by yourself. So for example, Taiwan can come out with a list of high-risk countries. Taiwan can say, I'm coming out with a blacklist of, I mean, the US has always been doing this. They've always been coming out with their own blacklist. But every country now, they kind of recognize that. It was not recognized in the past. In the past, it was only FATF countermeasures. Now they're saying that you can, it can be based on a FATF call or by yourselves. And countermeasure examples have been expanded and include increased supervisory examination and or external audit requirements for branches and subsidiaries. So definitely the cost of doing business has increased. So if you do business in which the fact of regard as being high risk, then you're subject to greater examination and, ex and or external audit requirements. So authorities in international cooperation is covered in recommendations 26 and 40. They, the FATF 40 provide better operational tools and a wide range of techniques and powers, both for financial intelligence units and legal enforcement agencies to investigate and prosecute money laundering and terrorist financing. In particular, there's a new element that the FIU is able to obtain additional information from reporting entities, example on customer due diligence, beneficial ownership, or on transactions. For example, if Bank A files a suspicious transaction report which says Bank B, funds came from Bank B, then the FIU will, can go back to Bank B and get all these detailed pieces of information from Bank B also. In some countries, that was always the case. That the FIU always had these powers, but this has now come into the FATF. So you have to do a specific gapping in your country to see what the gaps are from this. Need supervisory focus to cover usage of discretions under the risk-based approach by financial institutions. Supervisory review of money laundering and terrorist financing risk profiles and risk assessments prepared by the financial institutions needs to be done. This is in, 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 in interpretive note to recommendation one, okay? The FATA 40 clarifies that reporting includes not only STRs, but other information such as currency transaction reports, wire transfer reports, and other threshold-based declarations and disclosures. Now, this is, this is, not, this is not insisting that the, each country uh, introduce all these measures. It's just defining that here is a range of measures that's possible. Australia, for example, has wire transfer reports. There's a greater emphasis on international cooperation and information exchange between FIUs financial supervisors, legal enforcement, and non-counterparts. So it draws on the Egmont Group principles for information exchange of June 2001. <clears throat> and the FATF is going to further engage the private sector and issue guidance to enhance the feedback mechanisms and provide other more useful and relevant typologies. <clears throat> 